Hello, congregation, family and friends. Bereans, how are you? I pray that all is well with you. Welcome to this edition of Monday Night Manna. This is number seven for the year 2020, number seven already. In case you haven't been with me or you haven't seen these Monday night broadcasts lately, here's what I do. You know, when the Israelites were in the wilderness for 40 years, and you can read about this in the book of Exodus, God fed them in three different ways. First of all, he gave them water. Remember when Moses tapped the rock twice and the water was pouring out? So they had plenty of water to drink. When they were complaining that they didn't have any meat, God sent them quail. But God also sent them something called manna. And every day they could come out of their tents and on the ground was a bread-like substance that they could get and they could eat and it would sustain them while they were in the wilderness. It was physical manna or physical bread. Well, what I try to do on these Monday evenings is to give you spiritual manna, something from scripture that we can chew on, that we can digest during the week, something that God can teach us from his word. And hopefully at the end of this broadcast, you have been fed spiritual manna. And that's the idea behind these Monday night broadcasts. Tonight, we're going to be looking uh, at a portion of scripture, a familiar portion of scripture in Philippians chapter four. So if you have your Bibles with you, I'll give you a moment to turn to Philippians four. And we'll be looking at verses, let's see, six, seven, eight, and nine. You've heard it preached before. I've even worked through this passage before on several occasions over my years of preaching. But I want to bring hopefully maybe a, a fresh perspective tonight when it comes to what we think about and what we focus our minds on and what consumes our thoughts. And then what do we do with those thoughts? It's very easy especially in today's world where things are coming at us rapid fire, where we seem to live in one of these societies that everything is happening faster than we can actually process it. We have dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of decisions to make every day. We're running to and fro here between jobs and family and friends and re uh, religious or church responsibilities trying to get the proper nutrition, trying to get sleep. All of these things are bombarding us every day. If you're a big television watcher, or and I'm not a big television watcher, but no matter where your social media is, we're constantly being bombarded with things. Where do we find that line to draw between what is godly and ungodly? What is something that is, that is healthy that we can focus on and something that is unhealthy? Are there guidelines? Does God give us some kind of a formula where we can control what we're thinking to blot out those things that are bad and to keep those things that are good. And how does that tie into our prayer life? That's what we're going to look at. And so we are in Philippians 4, and I'm going to just read a verse at a time, and we'll break it down a little bit. So if you're with me, Philippians 4, beginning in verse 6, it says this, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Now, we could sp I could spend an hour preaching on this one verse, but let's break it down very briefly. First of all, the Apostle Paul, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is giving us commands here. The first command is, be anxious for nothing. Remember when Jesus was saying, don't worry about tomorrow, what you're going to wear, what you're going to eat, and so on. Tomorrow has enough worries of its own. Just focus on today. Don't be anxious or don't be worried or don't be overly concerned about something. That doesn't mean, and Paul is not saying, that we shouldn't care, that we shouldn't care about anything. That's not what he's talking about. He's saying, don't be anxious for anything. You know what anxious is. It's, it's the root word anxiety. It's stress, it's pressure, it's nervousness, it's restlessness. How many times do we, do we have something that happens to us or we're thinking on something and we become anxious, we become stressed out? And you know what that leads to a lot of times? Bad health, ulcers, we're popping the tongues, we're going to the doctor and getting the latest prescription because we can't sleep at night because we can't settle down. Our stomach is upset and so we have to watch certain foods. It just goes on and on. Be anxious for nothing. 
Why? Why should we be anxious for nothing? Well, Paul is going to explain shortly why we shouldn't do that. But so that is a command up front. Do not be anxious for anything. Don't stress on anything. Here's what we should be doing. If we get to that point, here's the rest of it. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, please notice the word everything, not some things, not just when you feel like it, not once in a while, everything. What are we supposed to do? By prayer and supplication. Let's talk about that. We all know what prayer is. Prayer is how we communicate with God. Prayer is us talking to God. Prayer is however you talk with God and however I talk with God. When we're making our requests known to him or whatever, we're just pouring our heart out to him or we're seeking a solution or we're spending time with him, we're in prayer. But then we see this big word here, supplication. And we can't just go past that. We have to understand what does supplication mean? What is it? What is supplication? Well, supplication is coming before God humbly with a request, humbly understanding that we are talking to the creator of the universe we are talking with almighty god and we need to approach him with humility and with reverence and with awe understanding that the god who is listening to us is the same god who spoke the universe into being the same god who sent jesus christ to die for us on the cross of calvary we need to approach him with proper respect we're not supposed to be flippant. We're not supposed to be disrespectful. We come to him with supplication. But there's another element you see. The next thing says, with thanksgiving. When's the last time we actually thanked God for something? Was it just for the big things? Was it just for that uh, financial blessing you got? Or maybe you were healed of some kind of disease or whatever the case may be. When did you last thank God for something? Did you thank him when you got up this morning because you got up and you were able to get out of bed and you're breathing and you could dress yourself and make a meal and go to work or whatever it is your day was today? Did you thank God today for that? We are supposed to come to God with these elements in mind. First of all, and let's review this and then we'll finish out this verse. Number one, we are to be anxious for nothing nothing don't worry about things don't panic over things don't stress over things the older the more mature i have gotten as a christian over these years the more i understand this verse when i was a young christian and, and look we're all human there's still times that we can get anxious or we worry about something but i have learned quite the hard way but i have learned to just turn everything over to god and let him work things out now sometimes God doesn't answer things when I, I'm hoping or in the way that I, I hope that he will. I have several petitions. I mentioned this at church yesterday. I have several petitions before the Lord right now. He has not answered them. Does that mean he's not listening? Of course not. God will answer in his way, in his time, when he's ready and how he wants to answer it. That's fine. I'm not going to be anxious for anything. I'm just going to turn it over to him. Let's look at this verse. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, everything, by prayer and supplication, we just talked about what supplication was, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Please notice the word request. He's not talking about demands. God is not a puppet that we can just demand things from God or tell God what we want, and he's supposed to do it. That is reducing God to our level. God is God, almighty God. He is the God who created this universe into being. And how dare we come to God with demands of any kind? God, you have to do this. God, you must do that. No, that violates everything that this verse is talking about. We are to be, first of all, anxious for nothing. Second of all, by prayer and supplication, that means in a humble spirit, come before him with reverence and awe and respect, with thanksgiving, thanking God, making our requests known to him, not demands, requests. Lord, if it be your will, is it possible that I would be healed? Lord, if it's your will, would I have a new job? Or would you lead me to the spouse 
that I've been thinking about and praying about? Is it your will? Is it possible, Lord, that I might be married one day? Is it possible, Lord, that there may be a job change or that my child might be healed or whatever your request is, it is a request. It's not a demand. There are some people that just say, well, God, whatever you say, you say it, you speak it, you believe it, and God must do it. No, he doesn't. The Bible doesn't say that anywhere. And if you're going to quote the verses asking you shall receive and so on, you're taking it out of context without using it in its proper context. God is not some celestial puppet that every time we say, God, do this, do that, we pull his strings and God automatically does it. How dare any of us, any of us approach God that way? We have the blueprint right here. Now, if that wasn't enough, let's move on to the next. Now, here's what's going to happen. If we do things God's way here in verse eight, 6, look what happens in verse 7. Verse 7, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding or all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. See how this is connecting? Now watch. If we approach God the right way, if we're praying to God the right way, if we're giving him thanks and we're making our requests known, guess what happens? Because we're not anxious for anything, because we're not worrying about anything, we receive something called the peace of God. Jesus told his disciples, he said, peace I leave with you, not as the world leaves you, but as I leave you. This is, this is peace that passes all understanding. This is godly peace. This is divine peace. This is supernatural peace. This is peace far beyond anything we can understand. We may think we have peace in our life, but God will shower us and cover us with his peace, the peace of God which surpasses anything that we can even think or comprehend. Now, what is a byproduct of receiving this peace of God? What happens as a result of it? It says it right here. When we receive that peace of God, we now have our hearts and our minds guarded in Christ Jesus. Wow. You ever think about that phrase? Our hearts and our minds will be guarded in Christ Jesus. How is that possible? Because we have the peace of God. If we were relying and I was relying on my peace or your peace and you were trying to do it on your own, we would not have that. We wouldn't have that supernatural guard. And how this all plays into it, and we'll be looking into the next verse where Paul gives us very specific things that we are to focus on. And the only way we can focus on those things is if we have the peace of God that surpasses any understanding or any comprehension. It goes beyond anything we could ever imagine. Wouldn't you want and don't you want your heart and your mind guarded in Christ Jesus? Don't you want to just think on godly things and do godly things and be obedient to what God has called you to do and live a life that is pleasing to him? So that when you are standing before him, you hear those wonderful words, well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the Lord. Don't you want to hear that? Or do you want to make demands upon God and get whatever you can right now? God, you have to do this and you have to do that. That's a wrong mindset that goes against everything that we're looking at here. We have to be very careful. Let's be very, very careful in how we approach God. We don't demand things of God. We don't tell God what to do. God tells us what to do in his word. And as we're looking at, we just looked at two verses. Look at all of this spiritual matter that we're being fed already, just from two verses. I want the peace of God. I want that peace of God that passes all understanding because I don't trust my own peace. I don't trust my own mind. I don't trust my own emotions. I don't trust my own words. I don't trust my own motives. I don't trust myself at all. Why? Because even though I'm born again and even though I have eternal life in my soul existence, I still have a body that lusts after sin. I still have a mind that is corrupt. I still have a heart that does evil things and thinks of evil things and protrudes evil things. We are not totally perfect yet until we receive our resurrected body in the new world. But right now, we're receiving guidelines right here from the word of God, how we are to behave, how we are to think, how we are to act. The peace of God that passes 
all understanding will guard your hearts and will guard your minds in Christ Jesus. I want to be guarded that way. I want that safeguard. I want to be able to have that barrier between me and the world, between me and Satan, between me and temptation, between me and sin. I want that peace. I want that barrier right in between us so that Satan can't penetrate, so that sin can't permeate my whole life, so that I'm not taken down the wrong path and doing the wrong things and thinking the wrong things. Now, God's not going to leave us without some suggestions on how we do this. So we would, when we look at verse 8 here, it says here, let's read them. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there be any excellence, and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. Right there is a checklist for you and for me. These are the things that God is telling us to dwell on. What is good? What is right? What is honorable? What is of good report or good repute? If there's any excellence in it, if there's anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. Now, you think of all the things in an average day that you go through and I go through. All the things that we're exposed to, whether it's visually, whether we hear them, whether we think about them, whether they're brewing in our hearts. Think about all the people in our life, the circle of people that we associate with, our friends, our family, our coworkers, neighbors. Think about all the things you do in an average day, all the things you think about, all the people you interact with. And God is telling us to draw that line. We do not have to dwell on evil things or suggestive things or things that are perverted. There's a lot of that going on in the world today. We don't have to dwell on those things. We can think about these things here. Now you may say, oh, well, Thomas, that's kind of a lame list, isn't it? Whatever is pure, whatever is good. What... You wanna call God a lame list here? Is God giving us a lame list? Listen to this. Whatever is true, honorable, right, pure, lovely, good repute or good report. If there's any excellence and anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. Now, we can go down and we could give a hundred examples, thousand of examples. We don't have time to do it, but you think about it. What, if, what has consumed your thoughts? As, you, as, if, as you're watching this live, we're in the evening here on Central Time. It's after 7 p.m. Central Time. But if you're watching this at, on a replay, no matter what time of day or night it is, whatever you're watching, what consumed your thoughts today? What, what did you see that wasn't pure? What did you hear that wasn't right? What did you do that wasn't honorable? See, this is the way that God can convict us. If we're coming to God with all of our faults and all of our requests, Lord, I shouldn't have used that language today. Please forgive me. God, I, I, I tried to justify watching that movie, and I knew there was going to be a couple of bad words in it, but I just kind of thought it's only a couple of bad words. I really wanted to see that movie. And after you watched the movie and you found out there was a nude scene or you found out there was violence in it, all of that hit your eyes, all of that hit your ears, all of that went into your mind, all of that went into your heart. And then you turn around and you're not, you are not dwelling on anything good, on anything pure, on anything right, or anything honorable. You've seen something or you've done something that God is not pleased with. If we confess those before God, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 tells us, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So if we fell down today, if we sin today, and all of us do, if we fell down and we sin today, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. But we need to come to him and say, Lord, forgive me for that. Here's what I want you to do because I'm taking this challenge myself. Starting right now with this video, I want you to look at these words and these categories and these things that Paul is talking about in verse 8. 
And I want you to challenge yourself, as I'm going to challenge myself, to only focus and dwell and put our energy and put our thoughts into these things. If there's anything that has excellence in it, if there's anything that's worthy of praise, anything that is pure, anything that is right, anything that is true, God's word is true. Satan is a liar. God is true. There's something to focus on. We all understand right from wrong. Right is what God says is right. Wrong is what God says is wrong. We can start cultivating a different mindset. You and I can start learning to be more obedient to the Bible. Let me finish this section out here. Because sometimes when this passage is preached, this last verse is left off. Because we're left looking at all of these things that we can concentrate on. But look what Paul says. Verse 9. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things. And the God of peace will be with you. Notice, once again, he's now talking about the God of peace. Remember a couple of verses before we saw the peace of God. Now we're talking about the God of peace. One and the same thing. The peace of God comes from the God of peace. But notice what Paul is saying. He's saying, those things that you have learned from me, you've received from me, You've heard from me, and you have seen from me. Paul was a walking example of Christ. He suffered for his, his faith. Paul suffered more persecution than almost anyone else in Scripture. He kept going and going and going. He would be in prison. He would be shipwrecked. He would be stoned, and he kept going. And he kept preaching the word, and he kept going where the Holy Spirit led him to go. Nothing held him back. He was focusing on Christ. He even said, for me to die is gain. If I lost everything in this world, everything, if I have Christ, I've gained everything. His focus was on what was right and what was true and what was honorable and what was praiseworthy. He didn't get caught up in the world. He didn't get caught up in the world. And he had plenty of opportunity to do that. But even when Paul was in prison, he was writing epistles from prison. He was having people come to him. He was still ministering to people while he was in chains in prison. Paul never stopped. And when you read 2 Timothy, which is the last book that he wrote, the last epistle, he tells Timothy near the end of the book, I'm ready to be sacrificed. My time has come. I've run the race. I've done what I can. I'm ready to be poured out as a drink offering. I'm ready to be poured out. I'm ready to die. Right up to the very last thing, Paul was focusing on these things. And so what is he telling us in this verse? Whatever you've heard, whatever you've seen, whatever I've taught you, whatever you have received, practice these things. It doesn't happen overnight. Practice these things. Wherever you're at in your walk with Christianity today, I guarantee you that if we start focusing on things like this, tomorrow's walk will be a little easier. And next week's walk will be a little easier. And next month's walk will be a little easier because we're going to discipline ourselves to focus on the things that are true, that are right, that are lovely, that are of good report, that have praiseworthiness to them. When we start focusing on that and weeding out all those evil things, all those bad influences, all those things that the world says you need and you have to have this and the world tries to tempt you in a thousand different ways to fall on your face and fall into sin. Whether it's something visual, something to hear, some kind of alternate lifestyle, the world will keep trying to get you through Satan to fall on your face. And if you do, we will never have the peace of God and we will never receive anything from the God of peace. We will be in turmoil. We will toss and turn at night. Our hair will turn prematurely gray. We'll wind up on all kinds of medications to calm our nerves and to sleep at night and then to wake up in the morning. We may turn to alcohol or drugs or food or sex or some other vice to take away the pain because we're not at peace. Don't you want the peace of God? Don't you want the God of peace in your life? I do. That is why I hope that in this brief time, this passage has fed you. I pray that this is manna that you can chew on this week, that you can digest this week. You can apply this to your life starting right now. I encourage you not only to just read this passage, I encourage you to read through the book of Philippians. It's only four chapters. It's not going to take you that long. But Philippians pound for pound is one of the most awesome books in all of the Bible. There's men, much more wisdom than just these verses. But for right now, I pray that this has been some help to you. If it has, 
please feel free to share it. God said in his word in Isaiah 55, verse 11, he said, my word will not return void. It's going to reach all those people he intends it to reach. So if it reached you today, if this ministered to you today, if you were fed today, then this word was for you. And if you know someone else that, that wants to hear this word and could use this in their life, please feel free to share it with them. This is not, this is not for my gratification. This is the word of God going forward. And God says that when he sends his word out, it does not return void. Somebody's going to hear this. Somebody's getting delivered from their thoughts. Somebody is getting saved from this word. Somebody. So share it. The other thing I always encourage you, Bereans, our church family, we call ourselves Bereans for life. Bereans for life. You know why? Acts 17, 11 talks about the Bereans. And it says that they were more noble than all others. That doesn't mean that they were smarter. They weren't nicer looking, didn't have more advantages than anyone else. Paul was preaching to them like he preached in every other synagogue. But here's the difference. They received the word that Paul was preaching with all readiness, eagerness. Their hearts were open. Their minds were open. Their ears were open. Their eyes were open. They wanted to hear the word. But they didn't stop there. And you and I shouldn't stop there either. All of us can hear a good sermon or go to a Bible study and say, wow, wasn't that good? I really got fed. But was it the truth? What the Bereans did was they went to the scriptures. Read it, Acts 17, 11. They searched the scriptures daily, every day, not just on Sunday, not just for midweek Bible study. They searched the scriptures daily to make sure what they were hearing was true. You owe it to yourself to do the same thing. Whether it's me, a particular church you belong to, a Bible study you go to, someone you watch on Christian television, maybe you listen to somebody on Christian radio, somewhere out here on social media. If you're hearing the word of God preached or taught, you owe it to yourself to take down all the references, write down the main points, and then study scripture for yourself to make sure what you heard was true. Because there's a lot of bad doctrine out there. There's a lot of people saying things that just aren't true. They're just not biblical. There's a lot of that going on, but the Bible warns us that there's going to be false prophets and false Bible teachers. It was happening in Jesus' day. It's even worse now. So be a, be a diligent Berean. Study that word. Get into the word. There's nothing more important you can do than study the word of God. You want to know who God is? You want to know about God? Read his word. God only wrote one book. It's called the Bible. Lastly, would you please pray for this ministry? Those of you who've been around for a while know that Satan almost knocked us right off uh, completely. But here we are in 2020, and we're back on the air. We're not up to the full schedule that I would like. Um, hopefully one day we can do that. But for right now, would you please pray for this ministry? As you can tell, I am someone who's kind of loud when it comes to preaching. I get passionate. I get passionate because this is the life-saving word of God. I get passionate. But I'm too bold for some people. Uh, I preach on things that other pastors or preachers shy away from. I'm not going to shy away from anything. If you're looking for a sugar-coated, feel-good gospel, you're on the wrong channel. You tuned into the wrong ministry. But if you want it straight up, straight as God gives it, the good, the bad, and the ugly, you're going to get it here. But in order to do that, I need to stay in good physical health. I need to stay strong, and I need my prayer warriors around me to help me stay strong and bold and unwavering and on the front lines for Jesus. I'm not backing up, and I'm not going away. It doesn't matter what the devil decides he wants to do because greater is in me than he who is in the world. I have the Holy Spirit in me. I have Almighty God on my side, and God cannot be defeated. Satan is defeated. Please pray for this ministry, and if God would lead you, to support us financially, we'd be ever so grateful. You don't have to. This, this is not one of those ministries where you have to write a check and pay for a prophecy. You have to send me money before I'll pray for you. I'm not one of those pastors. They're out there. Those ministries are out there where you got to sow a seed to do something. No, that's between you and God. If God leads you to support us financially, then by all means, please do. And we'd be grateful for it. And it would just plow right back into the ministry so we can keep going. But if God doesn't, please make sure that you're on alert. Please make sure that every time we're out here, that you're with me. Because I'd love to see you here. I'd love to fellowship with you here and interact with you here and be able to share the word of God so we can learn together. If you are led to support us, if you're on Facebook, you can do it right through Facebook Messenger. It's quick. It's easy. It's safe and secure. It takes less than a minute. We've had people do it that way. And if you're on another platform here, 
or even on Facebook, we also have a new location through PayPal. It's living in harmony at mail.com. Living in harmony, that's capital L, capital H, all one word. Living in harmony at mail, M A I L dot com. And that you can send in your PayPal offering that way, or you can do it through Facebook offering. We also have one or two people that send in their offerings through the mail. If you're interested in that, please get in touch with me. I'll let you know how to do that. But even if you don't support us financially, please pray for us. That's the most important thing. Pray for us. Pray that this ministry will go forward, that my voice will stay strong, and that the devil will not win because Jesus Christ is in charge. So let's focus. Let's focus on what's good and what's right and what's true and what's lovely and what's of good report. If there's any praise in it or anything that's worth lifting God up, let's focus on those things. Thanks for being with me tonight. God bless you.